you happy for me to go? Yes, absolutely. And just remember okay. recording's on now. No worries. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone for um, having all of us here. So, uh, we're, my name is Sam Blanche. I'm from the University of Newcastle in um, in Australia, and I'm presenting this paper as Alok has already mentioned on behalf of two other authors as well. Um, I'm really just the delivery vehicle. So, um, and they'll all be available to answer questions, and I'm sure they'll answer all the questions actually. Um, so, the other thing to say is this is kind of um, we're all we're, we're all postdocs. At Newcastle, and we've all this is just a thing we've been working on together. So it has that kind of um, beginning quality, uh, if if I might put it like that. Um, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to introduce some of the background issues to do with Australia's refugee system. The second thing I'll do is I'll talk a little bit about disability in relation to refugee status uh, in Australia, and then I'll talk. Uh, I'll mention what we think an intersectional lens can contribute to to the discussion. So that's what we're going to do. Let me begin with some definitions. Uh, a refugee is someone who has been forced to flee his or her country because of persecution, war or violence. So that's our starting point. Um, in terms of the causes of mass refugee movements at the moment, the majority of movements today are caused by internal conflicts, ethnic cleansing, genocide, religious, cultural and ethnic intolerance, social, socioeconomic inequality, and increasingly, refugee movement is caused by conflict-induced famine, starvation and climate change, which ties into the disability thing, which we'll be talking about later. Uh, the UNHCR's annual Global Trends Report from 2015 found that worldwide displacement was at an all-time high. So at that point, one in 22 humans was either a refugee internally displaced or seeking asylum. So that um, uh, uh, gives us a little bit of context. So how does refugee processing work in Australia? Well, the first thing to say is, and anyone from Australia or familiar with it will be um, aware of this, it's quite important to recognise that Australia has a very inconsistent record, to put it mildly. Um, on the one hand, Australia is one of the highest per capita recipients of refugees for resettlement. On the other hand, uh, our policies of mandatory detention for so-called illegal maritime arrivals uh, has left a, basically a trail of destruction behind it. So that we have to hold those two things together. Um, in Australia, uh, refugee status is determined, processed and accepted through Australian domestic law. And it might, it, often it involves a determination by the United Nations Refugee Agency. There are different subclasses of refugee visas available for those processed, as we say, offshore. That, that is people that haven't made it here. Um, you can see some of those subclasses there at the bottom. I won't go through them, except just to point in particular to the women at risk subclass 204, which you can see down there, which I'll mention later. So how, across those, um, those subclasses, how is eligibility determined? There are different elements, obviously. Let me focus here on the third, uh, which, which requires that the minister must be satisfied that there are compelling reasons to accept refugees having regard to criteria like the degree or severity of persecution to which they're subject, their connection to Australia, whether another country can provide um, a resettlement and the capacity of the Australian community to provide for permanent resettlement. So there's some of the issues. Now using Justice Kirby, that's a former um, High Court judge from Australia, uh, using his, his uh, what, do we, what do we call it, um, equation, we understand persecution to mean serious harm alongside a failure of state protection. So harm and a failure to protect. So coming back to our definition of a refugee, to have a well-founded fear of persecution, a person must fear serious harm for reasons of race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or a membership of a particular social group. So you have all these categories sitting alongside one another. Now, in Australia, we have, um, let me speak a bit more broadly about how, how, how the processing system works. So broadly, the Department of Home Affairs describe, describes what, what we're calling a triage or a priority of processing like this. Let me, let me describe it. They say, and I'm quoting, we give priority to the most vulnerable applicants. This includes those that are assessed as refugees by the UNHCR, 
and referred to Australia for resettlement or those proposed by an immediate family member. And they also say, because of the limited number of resettlement places available each year and the high demand, we accept applicants in the most compelling circumstances only. Now this, what I'm about to talk about is in many ways the critical heart of this, this presentation. So every year decisions about the priorities and the number of people that will be accepted is made by the minister after consultation. So the minister should consult with the UNHCR and the public. The minister should hear from state and, ter state and territory governments. We have a federal system and from Commonwealth agencies and from peak refugee and humanitarian organisations. But in recent years, the quality of consultation has declined. In 2021, there was minimal, sorry, 2021, 2022 year, there was minimal opportunity for community consultation with the minister. In addition, there's little publicly available information about the selection process, apart from those very broad guidelines, which I talked about before. Indeed, at a higher level, you might say, it's been the policy of the Australian government to shut down conversation about the refugee program, partly by controlling media access. So it's very difficult to find information about how the minister grants refugee visas. It is not transparent, accessible, or open to Australians, let alone applicants. So for example, the Refugee Council of Australia has raised concerns about whether the Australian government discriminates against Muslims in its prioritisation. Although the Australian government denies that it's being discriminatory, questions are raised by the low, or at least were raised by the low levels of Muslim resettlement from Syria and Iraq uh, while those, um, during those conflicts. So it is the minister who determines Australia's focus regions, nationalities, and ethnic or religious groups in set resettlement policy. The main point is this, the minister's discretionary powers combined with a lack of consultation and an opaque system makes for what we think is a wicked combination for vulnerable people. So let me talk a bit about disability. It is our argument that disability, which is already and so often a cause of distinct vulnerability, is particularly invisible within the Australian policy apparatus. The relation between disability and forced displacement is very complicated. Let me mention some of the issues. Disability may be a consequence of forced displacement. So the forced displacement itself can have lasting physical and psych psychological effects. You can think of refugees who might have gone through various traumatic experience that, that experiences that can cause disability, um, torture, extreme fear, detention, harassment, dangerous journeys, deprivation of food, shelter, and healthcare. Um, disability can, can be a function of traumatic experiences, which include the experience with the states that receive the refugees. And I've mentioned the, the issues with Australia, uh, mandatory detention before. Finally, we should observe the heightened risk profile of refugees with disabilities. So they're more likely to be forgotten or excluded in every aspect of humanitarian assistance due to physical, environmental and societal barriers to accessing information, health, services, human rights protection. So forced displacement also amplifies the risk experienced by refugees, including the risks of sexual abuse, exploitation by family members and exclusion from access to services. Now, until 2012, Australia's refugee program explicitly discriminated against people with disability through what was called a health criterion. So if you didn't satisfy the health criterion, you wouldn't get a, a visa. Now migration policy directs the decision maker to waive this requirement for refugees um, with a disability. But it has to be said, this requirement still applies to migrants. What do we know about how the Australian government now responds to disability in the refugee population? Well, as part of the consultation pro process mentioned earlier, the government releases a discussion paper and a summary. For 2021, 2022, there was no mention of disability. This suggests that people with disability are not considered a cohort for prioritisation. We also know that in the 2015, 2016 financial year, 1.4% uh, of people who, res who were resettled through the program received a, um, a health waiver. So in other words, they had some sort of health issue, but they were granted a visa anyway. We don't know which of those waivers related to disability. Some of them might've been given for other health reasons. 
And we also do not know the number of people with disabilities that were not granted a refugee visa. So in short, Australia allows for refugees with disabilities, but we do not know how, about, how this actually plays out in the refugee intake. Moreover, we think that the evidence and the regulatory framework suggests that the process does not take into account that disability can play a distinct role in human vulnerability. Uh, Sam, five yeah. minutes. Thank you. Uh, this is where intersectionality comes in. So um, this is the last, the last section of what I'm going to be talking about. We think it helps, to, helps us to understand the particular vulnerabilities at work in situations of disability. So what is intersectionality? I'll start with that. In short, it observes that structural or an intersectional perspective observes that structural marginalisation emerges out of the intersection of different categories or axes of belonging. So you can think about this as a reaction. One way to think about this is a reaction against certain more narrow traditions of feminism and also certain narrow forms of liberalism which want to understand political and social rights which, which through what you might call a, a single or a narrow axis. Intersectional feminism would say that the marginality or the marginalization of a particular woman in a certain circumstance might not be just because she's a woman, but also because she is a woman and Jewish, let's say, and lower class. And you have to put those, each of those axes together uh, um, add up to, a, to, a, to, a, to, to, to a, her particular vulnerability. So it has to be said, intersectionality, does, intersectionality doesn't show everything. Someone can be subject to persecution just because they're from a religious minority. Other categories might not in fact be empirically relevant. A single axis might be the most relevant way to, to think about something. But what intersectionality does draw our attention to is the way that different axes of social life, different categories can intersect to produce special forms of marginalization or of empowerment, but I won't talk about that today. So I'm gonna give two examples. The first is an example of intersectional vulnerability offshore or in, in a refugee donor country, if, if, if I might put it like that. So let me, I'm gonna talk about Afghanistan and which helps us to see how vulnerability emerges in very particular ways. So more than one in five families in Afghanistan include an adult or a child with a serious disability, one in five. So what I'm gonna talk about is from a 2020 human rights report from before the Taliban regained control People with disabilities at this time were entitled to a pension uh, at different levels, for which purpose they needed to register at the Ministry for Labor, Social Affairs, Masters and Disability. So they need to go and register. And this is what happened when MR, which is a pseudonym, when she went to the ministry. And just a warning, this is a bit full on. So if you want to tune out now, do that. So this is what she says. I went to the ministry to get my disability certificate because the ministry pays up to 64 US dollars per month. I faced a very rude offer when I wanted to register myself at the ministry. The administrative employee he was, who was working there told me that he will process my certificate if I sleep with him. He asked me to sleep with him for a night while standing in front of his colleagues and they just laughed at me loud and louder. One of them told me, then what do you want? You want to be registered and get paid by the government without paying our share. How do you want to get your disability card when you won't sleep with us? I started crying and left. Later, when I shared this story with other friends and women with disabilities, most of them had had similar experiences. Even some of them told me that they will never visit the ministry because they will be harassed. Now, keep in mind, this is the place you needed to go to get your disability pension. So here we see how a particular risk emerges out of the conjunction of disability and gender at the same time. It's because of these two things at once that the person was at a particular risk. So what this report does not show the, the human rights report, human rights watch report I'm talking about, is how religion and disability and gender and ethnic tension might all come together in this way. It just alludes to what I'm talking about here. And Sam, interestingly, that one minute, okay, okay, I'll move on to my thank you. I'll move on to my second one. So the second example is in relation to vulnerability, in relation to the Australian refugee program itself. So I mentioned earlier visa subclass two hundred four for women at risk. The relevant part of the regulation says that the minister should be satisfied that the applicant does not have the protection of a male relative 
and is in danger of victimization, dot, 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 because of her sex. So an intersectional perspective works really powerfully here because of the phrase, because of her sex. So consider a scenario of mental health, say in a minority Yazidi population from Iraq. So a minority Kurdish uh, religious group. Um, consider, I'm, I'm just skipping forward, consider the case of Sabiha. So she was a Yazidi woman who was kept at home because she is profoundly deaf. Now she was kept at home because she was deaf by the when she was in, in country. Now this is just an example that was written up on an Australian news website. We don't know the details, but it's worth thinking of, thinking about. She's not just at a risk of harm as the regulation would have it because of her sex. She's at a, neither is she just at risk of harm because of her religion. She's at a risk of harm because these things come together in a particularly pernicious way. So you need to be able to pass out different aspects of vulnerability associated with, associated with different constellations of belonging, or at least that's what the intersectional approach would argue. So the Yazidi population was certain, certainly threatened by the Islamic State, but so are other subgroups, with, subgroups within that population. Okay, I'm going to conclude, so this might take me 30 seconds. What we want to highlight is the way that intersectionality foregrounds what is really actually a very awkward question in the Australian refugee program. How do we assess the relative vulnerability of these people? Of course, this is at the heart of the decisions made by the minister in consultation with the public that I spoke about before. But how do we assess the relative risk, for example, of say the disabled woman who I mentioned in Afghanistan, who was trying to access support against say, for example, another any other person from a non-Pashtun ethnic group or other heterodox religious group? How do you assess their relative risk? There's no easy answer to these questions aside from what we think, what, aside from what is a really formalistic one, and that is the need for greater transparency. We need to be able to see how the decisions are made. And this is what makes the lack of consultation and the general opaqueness of the minister's decisions and discretion so worrying. We can't have any sense of how different risks and vulnerabilities are assessed and different groups are triaged if the process is done behind closed doors. Because unfortunately, when things are done behind closed doors, we know that disability is probably what is forgotten. 